Good afternoon, Tableau enthusiasts everywhere. I guess probably good morning and, and good evening and good night as I think we, as we analyzed and ran the data on our last couple of sessions, we have folks joining us from a variety of time zones now with this new virtual format. Um, so welcome, hope this finds you well. I'm super excited about today's agenda and the, the top-notch speakers that we have. As you, as you can see from the agenda, and as you know, that's a, maybe a more thematic session focused on Tableau and higher education. Very excited for that. Um, but before we begin, just like a lot of us do um, in reoccurring meetings, we had some action items. And we, you know, in terms of the mission of this leadership team, one, keep providing you high quality content. I'm not even gonna wait for the, uh, the chat to fill up with all the thumbs up and emojis and icons or whatever else we can do in the Zoom meeting. I think we're continuing to do that for you and we're really excited to, to keep that momentum going today and into the future. Second, trying to provide a variety of uh, ways to engage with you all in the uh, Tableau community. You know, previously we had done more of a, a round robin or a rotation. I think that one of the last times we were in person and I'm not sure we're going to be able to do it today, but we have an exciting announcement about an additional um, opportunity and way to engage this community. So very, very exciting. And uh, as Aaron's sending out, if there's anything you'd like to see, oh, that, that, was, that was one of my, thank you, Aaron, for reminding me. Um, in terms of the third point, we talked about maybe sending out a survey and canvassing the community. Did not, did not get that accomplished since the last meeting. We will be working on something here. Um, kind of got in the way of our, I think of our collective day jobs, but as Aaron is reminding the community, whether it's here on our LinkedIn page or reaching out to us you know, via email, happy to hear, very excited to get your input and how we can do the best job we can you know, as ambassadors, as liaisons to just really connect this community and help you all uh, do the best you can do in terms of Tableau, your job, the experiences you're having out there. So we'll be sure to deliver on that. Um, but with that, we will do a quick, quick introduction in case you're wondering who the heck is this guy. Um, I'm Steve Bartos, one of the co-leaders of the TUG. Currently um, running, a, have the honor of leading our advanced analytics team at Worthington Industries. So that's me. Um, I don't know if we're going to, go, going to hop over to Derek real quick. Derek, are you still there? I'm with you, Steve. Leader. All right. I'm, I'm here. Great to, be, great to talk to everybody again. Derek Shreve here. I am a uh, local Tableau sales rep. I live in Dublin. I've uh, been at Tableau for five years and work with another, a number of uh, customers here locally and across the state. Great to be with you all today. Turn things over to my colleague, Aaron. Awesome. Uh, my name is Aaron Hamm. I work at Nationwide Insurance. I'm a consultant for data, and data analytics and visualization within our financial reporting and um, accounting policy space. And so I help lead the Nationwide Tableau user group as well as the Columbus Tableau user group with Steve. So with that, um, we've talked about what's new and the uh, next step, we're just gonna go, run, go ahead and run through the agenda today. Um, we have two great speakers today, Jeremy Pattis and Sue Schiller. Um, both of these are gonna be focused on education and Tableau. Um, so Jeremy is going to focus on um, how to teach others in the other organization. He will show you how to put together lesson plans, how he puts together lessons plans for his graduate students and undergraduate classes and the books that he's used to help guide their cl the class and laying the foundation for future success in Tableau. Um, she was going to be focused on, this session we'll take a look at the components and process of design and telling good stories. Um, so what components and design need to go into your presentation that way you're telling a good data-driven story to make a great business decision. And then lastly, but not least, um, we will have some closing remarks. We are hoping to have some exciting news to share with you guys, um, something that will engage the entire community. So if we get the final okay on that, we will announce that at 2.50 as well. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jeremy. So Jeremy right now is a lecturer teaching applied marketing and analytics. Um, 
at Baldwin Wallace, I believe. Um, he is also a manager at Highland Software in Westlake, Ohio. Um, he also is an avid Tableau user and the co-leader of the Cleveland Tableau user group. So happy to have him on board with the Columbus Tableau user group. Um, he's very passionate about marketing analytics and thoroughly enjoys working with data, creating visualizations and utilizing data to, to drive insights through storytelling and analysis. So with that, we'll turn it over to Jeremy. All right, thank you very much, uh, Aaron and Steve. Very much appreciated. Uh, so yeah, I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. So hopefully you guys can see my screen uh, in full view, good to go. So yeah, so the topic I'm gonna talk about today is teaching with Tableau at Baldwin Wallace University. And like Aaron said, my name is Jeremy Paytas and I am an adjunct professor at the school. So our agenda today is one, how did I get here? Uh, two, an overview of the classes and, and their needs. Why, uh, why I use Tableau and why it made perfect sense. And then uh, developing a lesson plan. So understanding the needs of the course and trying to build out a syllabus that, uh, that would reflect that and a, uh, an approach to learning. And then also I'm gonna finish with the, the learnings and resources that I've come across the way and hopefully able to share that with you. So if you're ever uh, looking to become an adjunct professor or uh, become a mentor to someone or, um, or you know, uh, do a, a tug within your, your local organization and you just wanna help teach, these resources might be of use. So to start is how did I get here? So what is necessary to become an adjunct professor? So there you'll see on the right is actually a, a resume I built out in, in Tableau and it's available on Tableau Public, but I just thought it was a fun way to kind of show the journey, right? Starting with the bottom, uh, starting out at Clean State, got my bachelor's in marketing and then, then got my MBA, which is actually the first step, right? So MBA is, is actually required. Uh, for teaching uh, business at Baldwin Wallace. And then work experience. So everything you see there, I uh, started off in banking and then worked for an agency, which was a lot of uh, business to consumer marketing. And then actually now at Highland Software, where I focus a lot on B2B. So I think that experience really helped. Uh, an aspiration to be a teacher or mentor. When I um, was in college and trying to, to decide what I wanted to do, uh, I, I initially wanted to be a teacher and coach football. Uh, so one of two of those things happened, which I'm excited about. Uh, and this actually gave me a, an opportunity to teach. Uh, that desire to learn. So one of the things I found is, is by teaching you learn and you learn so much. While I had many years of experience with uh, analytics and data, uh, I continued to learn how to formally, formally view it and build it and categorize things in my brain to make it a lot easier. You also need time and availability. Uh, building up that initial lesson plan takes a lot of work. Um, and being available to your students is also key. So, so having that feedback and working with them so you can help develop them is essential. Uh, having a passion for whatever you're teaching. Uh, like Aaron mentioned, I, I do love marketing analytics. I have a very passionate about it. Uh, I have been for a long time. I just like the idea of trying to get better and better and using analytics to get better and better. Uh, patience is another thing. So you're gonna find that the, the, the spectrum of use and knowledge and skills and abilities of your uh, student population might be widely varying, right? You have people that might not be familiar with technology uh, and you have people that are potentially certified Tableau experts as well. So you need to kind of cater to all lenses. And then luck. So for me, the, the luck portion came in uh, as to how I actually became involved at Baldwin Wallace. I was actually speaking at a Cleveland Tableau user group and afterwards was approached by a woman, uh, Dr. Lori, who, uh, who asked me if I'd be interested in teaching at, at Baldwin Wallace and, and it kind of just went from there. So. Uh, in, that, in that regard, a little bit of luck is involved. So I thought I'd start by really giving you guys an overview of the classes. So I teach two, one is applied marketing analytics and the other is visualizing data for analysis. So through the uh, applied marketing analytics lens, it's a, it's a graduate level course. So we took, I took these factors into consideration. One being the audience, right? A majority of these uh, individuals have a, 
have work experience. Uh, there's a gap between when they got their bachelor's to their current um, aspirations to get uh, an MBA and, and they have work experience. So with that, there's actually various experiences uh, in the work environment. So there's both business and non-business. Um, another thing to consider is the wide age range of students. Um, I've had uh, anywhere from, you know, 20s to, I believe, 50s. So that wide age range is, a, is something to consider. And then again, the technical and non-technical, um, which is important because down the, down the road, you want to figure out kind of what the lowest com common denominator is for a lot of people to, to build that foundation. And I'll talk about that in a bit. So the time frame for this course is eight weeks. And I mentioned that because I had to take that in consideration because when I first started teaching, it was 12 weeks and then they, they condensed it down to eight weeks. And then sometimes it's shorter because uh, we might have a holiday that falls in and I have a smaller time frame. And I, I actually have three hours per week to try to deliver this content on a timely basis. So in terms of material, I knew, I knew that these were the things I wanted to cover. Uh, in the class. So setting that, that data foundation, which I think is very critical to all things analytical, right? Whether it's, it's marketing or finance or whatever it might be, understanding data and how to structure data is critical. Uh, also understanding those data visual, visualization best practices, um, understanding marketing strategy, which is kind of the why. So wh why is there a marketing analytics function and wh why do I care? as well as the, the how. So how do you go about figuring out, optimizing your campaign performance? Uh, you do that through, through marketing analytics, right? Uh, and then the topics I, I decided I wanted to cover were uh, operational reporting, uh, looking at e email and telesales and, and those sorts of things. Campaign performance is another one. Explaining the difference between business to consumer and business to business and how those vary and, and differ. Uh, customer profiling, so part of marketing is really understanding who your customers are and how you can best target them and who's engaging with you as a, as a, as a customer. Uh, digital marketing, so that includes all things Google Analytics, you know, pay-per-click, those types of efforts. Uh, social media, which is, which is a lot of fun. And I actually have a guest speaker for that that comes in and speaks to um, how uh, social media is, is interesting in the way that they gather data and information about you. And then uh, the delivery method. So for, so for me, this class, uh, it was brought to me as a flex scheduling. Now what that means is that could be, they can attend in class, uh, they can view it remote. So getting familiar with, you know, setting up cameras and things like that, or they could view it recorded. So always, be, always being, um, in the back of your mind that you are being recorded and somebody's going to view this later is also important as well. Um, and then from a technology perspective, so people are using their work computers. Uh, they might have VPN issues or they might have uh, programs that they need to install and might not have access to it via their work computers. So that's something to consider. Uh, do they have a personal computer, uh, one that can work and then one, one that has like enough memory and RAM to be able to execute these programs? Uh, in the remote environment, we need to consider their actual workspace. So uh, do they have the availability to, to really sit down and focus and, and uh, be there? And then I always like to, my work computer's a PC, but then I, I, my personal computer's a Mac. So I do like to cater to both audiences, you know, and it's really just a matter of saying uh, control as opposed to command and, and things like that as, as we work through it. So, so that's the applied marketing analytics course. The next course is uh, visualizing data for analysis. And this is an undergraduate level course. And again, the, the, one of the things I needed to consider was the audience. Uh, and that's actually obviously a very important part of, of storytelling and, and presenting is knowing who your, who your target audience is. So the majority of them actually lack work experience. Some of them had an internship or two here and there, but the, the the actual work experience uh, is missing. Um, mostly I, I was dealing with digital marketing majors and uh, CIS students or uh, computer science students. 
and again, ranged from the technical to the non-technical. This course allowed for a little bit of breathing room. It was 16 weeks, which I actually enjoyed. Uh, I know it's twice as long, but I did enjoy uh, having the time to build out a uh, syllabus and build out a lesson plan that really allowed us to dive deep and focus in each area. Uh, these two things are the same. You'll see this on the other one. Again, setting that data foundation and developing data visualization best practices are both very key. Uh, and then the appropriate usage of, uh, of analytics and, and how to apply it. Uh, and then how to tell a story, which is very important. You could, be the, you could be the best at gathering data, you could be the best at analytics, but if you can't convey that message and really deliver uh, your call to message, call, <laughs> call to action to the end user, then your message could be lost. So the, the topics here, again, are storytelling with data, uh, talking about analytic interaction and navigation. So how are people gonna interact and view your report? Uh, a lot of best practices and techniques. Uh, and a, just a sampling here of, you know, part to whole, uh, looking at ranking, deviation, distribution, correlation, geospatial, which is one, one, personally one of my favorites and makes uh, Tableau just a, a clear winner. Um, and then the, the idea of building out exploratory dashboards versus explanatory dashboards. And hopefully everyone is familiar with that, but exploratory is really putting the, the, the power in the hands of the end user to explore the data and kind of develop their own analysis where explanatory, you're really telling the story. You're setting the stage and you're saying, you have a clear call to action of what you want them to do. So the delivery method here started in class. It was completely in class. And, and I actually prefer that because I like reading other people's, uh, their body language and I could see who's engaged, who's not engaged and uh, get a lot of that interaction where post COVID, it was a challenge, right? We moved to remote, a lot of people not sharing their screens, um, not as much interaction, had to deal with a, you know, a thumbs up here or there to really help drive the engagement. So that, that proved to be a challenge. Uh, and then technology. So like I mentioned before, personal computer, uh, the workspace involved, and then a Mac versus PC. So I'm gonna transition into getting into the Y tab Tableau as opposed to the, the overarching uh, position. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the overall um, uh, learning plan that I, that I developed. But on the left, you'll see here's a picture of Tableau Prep and on the right, uh, that Tableau Desktop. So you might ask yourself, well, why Tableau at all? Uh, Tableau actually has a uh, website, uh, Tableau for Teaching, which the URL is listed there. Uh, on top of providing uh, licenses to teachers and students, there's also uh, a lab license availability, which is key. And uh, they also offer up the availability of Tableau Online, which is which is pretty exciting as well. So, so setting it up and uh, enabling people to share and view on a server environment is key. So I also love about Tableau uh, is just hundreds of data sources. So no matter what you want to throw at it, whether it's an output from R or an Excel file or a CSV or a flat text file, whatever it is, Tableau can handle it. Uh, and then the resources available are, are vast. So very, <laughs> very, um, very welcoming community. Uh, people are, are great. It's a great community for beginners to ask questions, no matter if it's been asked before or a hundred times, people are will point you in the right direction. Uh, the training that's available. So uh, the video training and then the, the text-based training uh, is, is really great resources. And then um, best practices. So one of the things I found in one of the one of the resources I used is a uh, is a Stephen Few book called um, Show Me the Numbers. And I found that, you know, if you read that book, inherently, a lot of the things that Tableau has put in place out of the box are a lot of those best practices that are within that book. And, and, you know, just shared common best practices when it comes to data analytics. So the other the final point I wanted to make here is this in-demand skills. And I, I really do believe that. I, I do believe that uh, Tableau and analytics is, is a highly demand um, profession. 
and uh, everyone's getting more and more analytical and wanting to know what the numbers are behind a lot of the things that they're seeing. So to me, that was, that was very important. So here is Tableau Prep, and uh, I show this one screen because it, <laughs> this one screen actually allowed me to show everything that I, I list off to the left. So it's the, it's the ability to be able to stage the, the, the importance of the data foundation within the student. So Tableau Prep is excellent at that. It's, uh, it's able to take uh, disparate data sources. So again, in this example, uh, there's three CSVs, there's a, an Excel spreadsheet, and you can see them uh, in nodes as, as they're being uh, plotted out on the graph. And uh, it's very visual. Again, it's a drag and drop interface, which makes it really nice. Uh, it also helps to teach, uh, one of the lessons I learned in my career is that data is hostile. And what I mean by that is that uh, it, it needs attention, it needs interrogation, and a lot of times it needs cleaned up. So that's where we get into the clean wrangle and shaping the data. Tableau Prep is great for that. Um, again, interacting with, with different data sources visually, easily interacting with, with Excel. Uh, one of the things that I throw out there quite a bit is Excel is like the lowest common denominator, right? No matter, no matter what stage of an analyst or what stage of a business professional you are, everyone seems to know Excel. And, and dealing with Excel um, is, is very helpful uh, for Tableau Prep. I also like it because it introduces the concepts of joins and unions. Um, so throughout here, right, you bring these four disparate data sources together in a union. And then you have this other data set here that you're going to use to, to join additional information to that. So again, it helps with that uh, foundation. Uh, data relationships. So, so here, uh, in, in this view here, uh, I can also say, you know, using a Venn diagram, uh, showing the, the result of the join or, or how I'm um, managing that join. And then down here, I can see the results. So I, could, I can tell if it's a one-to-many relationship, if it's a many-to-many -many relationship, that sort of thing. And then uh, the ability to bring in calculated fields is key. So again, that's key to, to cleaning data and also filtering out data. Uh, that's all available. And finally, one, one key thing about this is the, uh, is the output. The output is a hyperfile, uh, which can be directly read into Tableau really easily, and uh, and it lends itself to uh, seamless execution between both tools. And it also the, the other thing too is I get a question the, the question a lot. Well, when do I need to use Tableau Prep and when do I need to, need to use just Tableau Desktop? And to me, it really depends on the the level of heavy lifting that needs to be done on the, on the data side of the coin. So that's Tableau Prep. Um, again, very powerful. And for me, it's been a great uh, educational tool. Now Tableau Desktop. So again, why it's, why it's really cool is you get to pick up from where Tableau Prep left off. Uh, the ability to, to connect the data sets directly. So while it can pick up from Prep, it's not always necessary. If you have a clean data source, um, you can just go ahead and connect it there. And it's also got some, you know, data management built in within it. The ability to easily create data, data visualizations uh, with, uh, with the show me feature and the drag and drop interface, it just makes it uh, really easy to, to help describe what's going on. The other thing I like about it is it clearly defines discrete values, uh, dimensions versus measures and uh, and just the, the ability to bucket that and conceptualize that is key to, to understanding uh, its use. Uh, a lot of students have utilized storyboards, which I've been impressed with. And of course, you're able to build out dashboards as well to help tell that story. The resources and the community associated with it, uh, again, are great. The ability to just say, hey, if you come across something that you're struggling with, Google it, right? You put it in plain terms and, and more than likely you're gonna get an answer. And then again, a key selling point to me was the ability to show it off, right? Through the course of, of the, 
class, they're building out these, these cool visualizations and, and stories that they want to share. And for them, it's, a, it's an opportunity to build out a portfolio as well as uh, interact with Tableau Public and, and get, your, get your face out there and, and really help sell yourself to potential employers. So the next step is, is really developing that lesson plan. So now that I, I knew what I had to do and I knew I wanted to involve Tableau, the next key was, was going about it and how did I want to go about it. So from there, uh, again, my two classes, Applied Marketing Analytics, uh, here's an example, customer profiling, as well as the visual data for analysis and how, how that would show. So I developed uh, a syllabus for the Applied Marketing Analytics, which uh, started with that overview of marketing analytics. What is it? How does it function? Why is it needed? Uh, some of the other marketing technologies that might be involved, right, Salesforce, um, uh, you know, Salesforce Marketing Cloud, Pardot, uh, that sort of thing, really try to help uh, develop the landscape and also talk about what marketing analytics professionals are, uh, whether you're a data scientist or, a, a, you know, just a marketing analyst or, or whatever it might be. Uh, again, laying that data foundation is crucial. Uh, we developed this ideal library of graphs, which I'll show in a moment. Uh, the weekly marketing and analytics deep dives. Uh, so once we got past the, the data foundation and the analytics overview, uh, we dove into that aspect of it. And that's what you saw there, the operation, operational reporting, the social media. And then the biggest challenge was trying to uh, continue the learning plan of things that might not be able to be covered during class. Again, this is that eight week session. So, I, so it was a matter of really trying to cram as much information in without overdoing it. So I selected chapters from Show Me the Numbers by Stephen Few, as well as story, Storytelling with Data by Cole Naflick. And um, a part, another portion of it was continuing the work from the hands-on portion of the class. So, so those three things, those three items or uh, assignments on a weekly basis let me know that they're well, while we might be focusing on operational reporting or social media for that week, that they're still getting the, the data foundation, the analytics foundation, the best practices, the storytelling, all of that. The tools that we use for this class, again, like mentioned, Tableau Desktop, Tableau Prop, and then there was also an element of r, &R Studio. And uh, the reason why I did that was to get, um, for social media data, I wanted to overlay uh, on Twitter data overlay uh, sentiment analysis. And I was able to accomplish that through R by bringing that in and calling the API and doing all that and then have the final visualization in Tableau. So that was actually a really cool project. So the overall class structure was the first half of the class uh, was a lecture. I'd, I'd go through the topic and um, you know cover all the different bases there. And that usually took about an hour, hour and a half. And then the second half was, was the, uh, the hands-on portion. So it was an elaboration on what we did earlier uh, in the day and uh, actually build out uh, analyses using data and the like. So, so that, that's very, very powerful and very hands-on. Um, and then there's also a, a year-end project that I've assigned, which is a presentation based on the, the weekly deep dive. So again, operational social media, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, I provided the data sets. So that was one thing I found is, is marketing data is kind of hard to find. So I went out and I, I uh, was able to harness uh, some data and wrangle it in and bring it. Uh, but I actually did find that some of my students brought their own data, which was great. Uh, very, very good. And uh, being able to, to utilize their own data uh, goes a long way, at least in terms of being interested in it. <laughs> And then I also provided a template to the students. So, so I'll show a couple things real quick. One is the syllabus, which is here. Let me see if I could bring this over. So here's the syllabus for, uh, for that class. Uh, it's not the prettiest thing, at least in terms of the, the weekly view, but I broke it down by uh, the section, uh, the course outline and the topic, the lecture portion. Uh, what we were going to do hands-on and what the assignment was. So, so well enough in advance, they're able to understand and what to expect on a week-to-week -week basis. 
uh, I found that this, this helped quite a bit. Um, and that went through the, the calendar year. Again, this is the one that was an eight week course. So it was able to all fit uh, relatively easy, but you can see the, again, setting that foundation is crucial in a week one and two. Uh, the other thing I wanted to share was the ideal library of graphs or ideal library chart. So this view, uh, this is something that I gave to those students and I said, hey, this is, this is the best practices that I found. And I, I actually built this out uh, to assist them throughout in talking about learning. This was a great learning exercise for me, taking all of that and putting that in here. So if I, you know, go ahead and click on this bar graph, it gives me a bunch of different examples and I provided some commentary down here as to, as to why you might want to use it or why is it a best practice and, and how best to go about it. So that uh, students found to be very, very useful. I know I'm going to get something about this for the, the whole pie chart thing. Again, I'm not a huge fan of pie chart, but uh, there are, I guess that there is a time and place every now and then for them, but typically I do not advocate them. Uh, so getting back to this, that's really the, the overview for the applied marketing Anal analytics course. And the difference here on the, the visualizing data for analysis is uh, the foundation's pretty much the same. It's really focusing on building out the course skills and analytics best practices. And a lot of that has to do with um, the understanding of why. Uh, why things are best practices. So the gestalt principles of, of understanding the visual aspect of, of data visualizations and why they appeal to us. Um, you know, color best practices and things like that. Um, understanding when it's best to use uh, time series as opposed to bar charts, as opposed to uh, scatter plots, all of that is involved in there. The storytelling with data, again, is an important piece of it. And uh, I'm excited for Shu uh, to, to really take a deep dive into that next. Um, but again, it, it's very key to understand how to, how to tee that up. The, we have weekly analytic deep dives. So looking at focusing one week on correlation or focusing one week on distribution. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible that you could stand up there and, and lecture for an hour and a half about one of these things. Um, but you can, there's a lot of information and a lot of best practices to be shared. Uh, so for this course, it was uh, the weekly assignment was uh, I assigned each week a student to bring in a data visualization example or to actually bring in data. And we'll do one of two things. We'll either pick apart the data visualization and talk about why it's good or why it's not good or what we could change about it and kind of rebuild it and restructure it. Or we could get just look at data. So a good example of that was somebody brought in uh, Spotify data and we looked at all of that data and we were able to look at, see if there was any correlation between the beats per minute and its popularity. You know, silly things like that, but it really got the class engaged and, uh, and it was a really good use of time. Um, so I, that was one of the things that I was really uh, excited about and I, I know the class looked forward to it every week. Especially too, the, the other example there I'll give is uh, COVID, right? It was, it was very early in COVID. Johns Hopkins University was starting to provide some of this data and the class wanted to take a look at it and build it out. And we were able to do that, which I thought was great. Um, for this, the, the, the tools were simply Tableau Prep and Tableau Desktop. Uh, the class structure, again, is slightly different. Like I mentioned, we re review the data or the visualization and we walk through that and talk about uh, best practices and, and things like that. And uh, the second part was the lecture. And then finally, the hands-on portion. Uh, so again, a really, really deep dive into that and building it out. Um, and then they had a, a year end project. And the thing I liked about this is, is again, it's fun. Uh, the students went out, I had them provide three data sets uh, that they were able to find. And I, I provided them with different resources um, out there, like Makeover Monday is a good example. Of, uh, of where to find data or there's a um, data.world is another good example of where to find data. Um, but, you know, set them free and said, hey, whatever, whatever you're passionate about, find data and we'll build up this cool story and we'll, we'll build up something that you're proud of that so that you can share. And uh, I did provide a template to the students and I'll just show that real quick. Uh, that looks like, oh, where is it? Let 
Hmm. Well, this is the student example that I was going to show. Um, but it, this is the core, these are the core elements of that. The objective uh, and thesis, the methodology, uh, the proof. Uh, so objective and thesis is, is what are you trying to prove, right? What, what, the why to, to your analysis. The method, methodology is how they go, went about it. What data did they bring in? What was, what was their thought process? The proof is just that, right? How did they develop their proof to prove their thesis? Uh, what was the results of that? Uh, what conclusions were they able to draw? Did, did, they, um, did it meet the, their thoughts outlined in the thesis or did it not and why? And then finally, if there was a call to action. So what did you want the end user to take from that? So, so that wound up being a really good tool in terms of handing off and, and helping them for their final presentation. So let's see. So before jumping into the, the well, I'll, I'll cover off on the learnings and resources and I'll jump into some student examples if we have some time. So from a learnings uh, perspective, uh, here's my list of tips and tricks. Oh, and I'm sorry, before I forget, uh, I just wanna illustrate the, uh, the syllabus that I landed on for, for that class. So again, you'll see the same, uh, same breakdown of the section, the lecture, the hands-on assignment, um, laying that foundation of technologies that are involved uh, from, from an uh, analytics perspective, the laying that data foundation, so same thing, joins, unions, uh, understanding what level you're at. Uh, this building core skills and physical perception is again, how the mind and brain work in terms of analyzing information that's brought to you. Uh, the analytics interaction navigation dashboard best practices, interac interactivity and how to utilize them. And then, then we got into everything with time series analysis, storytelling, geospatial, so on and so forth. But, um, but that wound up being uh, really successful, I think. Uh, getting back to some of the lessons I learned were keep it simple. So yes, I'm, I'm a Tableau certified desktop analyst, but it doesn't have to be overly complicated. Start with the basics, start with basic bar charts, time series, help them understand why they're doing what they need to do. Um, make it interactive. Always have that hands-on session. Um, people love using Tableau and they love interacting with it. So make that a part of your curriculum. A key element too is reverse engineering. So if you go out to Tableau Public and you find something you like, understand how to break that apart and find out what component you like and restructure it in your own way. Uh, not stealing it, but just you know, leveraging parts from it is, is really key. Another item is creating that feedback loop. So while I think I'm doing a great job teaching, I might not be connecting. So regular check-ins halfway through the course allows you to pivot, right? It allows you to say, okay, I'm not connecting with, with them. I need to either spend more time on the lecture, more time on Tableau, more time here or there. Uh, it helps you dedicate uh, your time better. Also uh, being hands-on. So when you are hands-on and you're moving through, be sure to move slowly and, and check in frequently. So how are you guys doing? Are you following along? Did you get the same answer as I did? Also encourage questions and stops as you move through. So, so a good example there is to, before you start presenting, say, hey, if you don't understand anything, please stop me because if you're not getting it, there's a, there's a good chance uh, there are others that aren't getting it either. Um, being explicit. So whenever you're, again, Tableau now is second nature to me. So I can drag and drop. I can create calculated fields. I can, I can do a lot on the fly quickly. Slow it down. Be explicit about what you're doing, that you're clicking the carrot, that, that on the drop dropdown you're, you're selecting this uh, is, is very helpful. Also explaining why you're doing these things, right? So, so it might be, it might be, you might be trying to get them to the end product, but explain along the way why you're doing this and how it's setting you up for future success within Tableau. And also don't assume. So, so this, is, uh, this one's on me. I assume that because I'm at home and I'm working off of two laptops, I'm sorry, a laptop and two monitors that everyone else is. Um, one of the things, one of the pieces of feedback I got is, hey, these lecture portions are great, 
but I can't see you in your screen and what you're doing and do the same thing on my screen and follow along with you. So that was, uh, that was a, a key component there. And then finally, don't assume familiarity with data. Even though they signed up for your class, knowing it's analytics, don't assume that everyone knows what a join is or, uh, or a union or that data needs to be cleaned or that there might be hidden nuggets within the data by splitting it out, right? Um, so just don't, don't assume. Uh, what else? Oh, so I also have some resources that have been very helpful to me along the way. Uh, those resources are Tableau Public, uh, the Tableau community, Makeover Monday, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, even, you can even incorporate Makeover Monday into your curriculum if you want. Uh, I've tried to do it. Uh, I just haven't really done it well. Um, but yeah, assign, you know, have them follow along, download the data and build it out and share it, right? Uh, data is ugly and data is beautiful is uh, our two Reddit threads that are great for finding different data visualizations visualizations that are working or ones that aren't. So it winds up being a really good uh, place for that. On Medium, there is a place called Nightingale, uh, which is solely dedicated to data visualization best practices and uh, dealing with tools. And, and uh, I just found that to be fascinating. Like I mentioned earlier, Tableau for Teaching, their website there is great. The books I tend to use are Storytelling with Data, for uh, my graduate level. And then storytelling with data, let's practice for the undergraduate. Uh, I found that to be really helpful. I, what, I, th those were actually my weekly assignments for the undergraduate course. So I'd find uh, one section, I'd assign that for homework, they'd come back with it with their thoughts on it and, uh, and we'd talk through it. I'd have a student come up and present and, and say what their approach was, why they did it. And, uh, and yeah, it was just a good opportunity for them to share. Uh, show me the numbers, information dashboard to design are two by Stephen Few, uh, absolutely crucial. Uh, visualize this is uh, Yao, Nathan Yao, I believe. Um, he has a really good book and then the big book of dashboards is a, is a very helpful resource. So you might be asking yourself, why should I teach or, or what's in it for me? So I found that for personally, uh, again, I talked about learning, how by teaching you learn. And I've learned so much uh, and I'm very grateful for, the, for this opportunity. Um, I've learned how to communicate better. I've learned how to be a better mentor. I've learned how to be a better manager. I've learned how to listen, how to, uh, I don't know, how to manage time. You just learn everything, right? It's, it's a very good learning process. There's also networking opportunities. So you meet, all, meet some up and comers, right? In the undergraduate and uh, MBA level that, that have come through, they're brilliant, right? They're, they're really smart people. And, and those networking opportunities are great. Uh, as well as other professors, uh, the involvement in the community. So what I mean by that is not only the Tableau community uh, because there is, an, uh, there is a resource for education out there as well, but also within your community. I feel, I feel tighter to the Baldwin Wallace community uh, and greater Cleveland area as a whole, just by teaching. You get to shape the future. So um, I feel like I'm helping shape the future of future analytics by, by using Tableau and using uh, best in class uh, tools and technologies and approaches. So I, I feel really good about that. And, and to me, it's a form of giving back. Uh, mentoring students, helping them grow, helping them develop uh, is something that I've always wanted. And while I love my day job, there's times I don't feel like I am able to, I don't get that feeling from that, where by teaching, it's an outlet for me that I, I do feel like I'm giving back. So before I wrap it up, um, I would like to show a few student examples and I'll show Andy's real quick. I had this up before, but he went through this, this great analysis and here's what he was able to, well, let's look at his thesis. So the purpose of the presentation was to answer two questions. Does higher, mile, higher mileage yield a faster marathon time? What is the peak age for both male and female marathoners? He also wanted to look at injury rates and seeing if there was a, a greater, uh, a higher amount of uh, injuries with uh, the mileage that, that's associated with it. 
So you threw this out there too, is he said that the peak male runner uh, for marathons is 35 while females are at 29. So if this is true, the data should form a U with uh, the faster time towards the middle of their career. So he was able to build out this, these analysis. This is a cluster analysis here that, you know, just an easy way to divide up uh, the data and, and view the data. He also looked at the marathon paces using a bubble chart. Granted, there could be better techniques, but a bubble chart sufficed here in terms of saying what were the most popular times. Uh, here's his marathon times and, and mileage and injury. And the conclusion here was it just seems to be scattered throughout the major injuries uh, with the non-injuries. So it was kind of inconclusive. And then the relationship between uh, age and marathon time here. So you can see how he really, he broke that out and brought that, that, data, that data to light. And you do see with age, uh, it is a little bit higher. And then there's a, that little bit of a dip here for 35 and then it continues to increase. You have this outlier over here where someone in their uh, later 50s actually had one of the, the better times. But I, I just thought that uh, this is a good example of that. And then the other example I wanted to give was from my um, uh, Applied Marketing Analytics course. So this gentleman was able to put together uh, email analysis of Baldwin Wallace uh, newsletter. And uh, so he was able to use this in context and help Baldwin Wallace at the same time. And I thought that was great. So looking at the different campaigns, uh, the worst individual performers uh, in terms of the, you know, had high unsubscribe rates or high bounce rates. Um, and then why are people unsubscribing uh, from each category? So he, you're able to break that down. Um, people either flagged it as spam or no sign up or something of the like, but, Again, I, the, I've been impressed with the output um, that they're able to develop within that short time. And, uh, and overall, it's been a very uh, gratifying experience. And uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions throughout. Um, if you want to reach out to me afterwards, I could be reached at jeremy.paytas at gmail.com. On Twitter, I'm at Jeremy Paytas. And then I started a, uh, a website that I'll be adding to, uh, which is adventuresinmarketinganalytics.com. So exciting times. So any immediate questions, comments, concerns, emotional outbursts? Hey, Aaron, I think we're you're coming in really quiet. I don't know if you're posing a question to Jeremy. I couldn't hear you. It's, it's okay. I think, I think yeah, I you're good the, now. Okay. Oh, yeah. um, so the first one was, have you considered putting the syllabus in Tableau? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because actually preparing for this, I thought about putting the syllabus in Tableau and using a Gantt chart and kind of flowing it all out. Right. So yeah. I, yeah. Of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'll, that'll then, be a to-do. The next one is, have you found that using polls or calling on people directly during an online training or discussion works well? Yeah, so, so polls for sure. Um, polls for sure. Yeah, I use them quite a bit. And, uh, I, and I seek uh, feedback through polls. I use Blackboard. That's, uh, the, I don't know if that's the standard everywhere, but that's what we use at Baldwin Wallace. And, uh, and it has a polling feature within there. I try not to call on people directly. It, it is... Again, post COVID, it's, it's kind of a challenge because I want to be sensitive to people's workspace. They might not want to share their workspace or their, you know, they could have kids climbing all over them. I don't know. I don't, I, for some reason, me personally, I feel uncomfortable putting them on the spot. Um, but that is a good question. I usually, I, I try to get solicit feedback. I do the old auction thing, going once, going twice, sold. <laughs> then I usually just answer my own question. But yeah, that's a great question. Perfect. And then the next one that we have is, how has your experience in higher education impacted the work you do in the business and the marketing anal um, in the business? And then in the marketing analytics class, can you briefly describe the degree that folks integrate R in Tableau, or does it tend to be more of a progression? You start with Tableau and prep, and then move folks to to R. Uh, that's a good question. I feel like there's a few questions in there. Um, <laughs> I'll start with the, uh, the, the latter, which is R and, uh, and Tableau. For that one, um, 
I, I do think for the applied market analytics, I do think it's important to understand data science and, and the plausibility of using R to, to help with that. I typically, I'll start with Tableau prep as laying the data foundation. I'll go into Tableau desktop and say, hey, look at that output we created in Tableau prep. Now we can use it here in Tableau desktop. And then that social media is really towards the end of the class. And um, it, for our, it, I'm not gonna lie, I really just kind of provide them the code and say, hey, copy, paste this, execute it, as opposed to walk them through it because um, it can be a little bit cumbersome. And it's, I love R, don't get me wrong. I, I think it's great, but um, for, for that audience, it, it just never seemed appropriate. And I'm sorry, what was the, I think there was a question before that. I might've answered half of it. I don't know. That, that actually, I was, I was interested, Jeremy, in how, as you, you know, you mentioned the impact that teaching has on, on your understanding of the subject. And uh, I just was curious how your experiences in higher ed have shaped your experiences, you know, working in the business. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I think, I think, um, I think it's really helped me become a better storyteller, right? Like I, I, I practice what I preach. I, I go through the steps. I go through uh, the steps of understanding my audience and what I'm trying to prove and what I want them to take away from it. So I, I do think I've, I've become a much more effective analyst uh, in that process, as well as being a better mentor and teacher, um, helping, helping uh, the people on my team grow and develop um, you know, by using a lot of the, a lot, a lot of the techniques, like, like that library of graphs that I created for this class, we now use that internally at Highland and we use that as a, as a resource for, for building out, uh, graphs. And it definitely helps with, with more junior resources. It gives them that, that foothold to, to really expand upon. So, so I think it's been tremendous. No, it's good to hear. I mean, I, I spent my, my, my first career was in was a high school teacher and spent some time in higher ed. And I think you become acutely aware of the um, never taking for granted how challenging it can be was, you know, you spend your time immersed in this analytic product and delivering that to the customer and how sensitive you need to be on that, that like the last mile, that conveyance of what you've done. And I, and I really liked how you had that laid out, almost like you know, we think about a research paper, right? What was our question? And even just being very explicit about that with your, you know, the decision maker, the, the customer, it's real easy just to jump in, let me pop this dashboard open and start. And then someone's oh, up on the, you know, that first little pane on the dashboard and you're already blitzing through and clicking <laughs> tabs and like being really explicit you become, I, know, and I see you shaking your head you, as you're, as you're educating folks, it becomes really clear when you just spend, you thought you just knocked the lesson plan dead and you had a student waiting and they're still asking about concept one that you thought everyone, you nailed in the first five minutes, right? So. Patience. <laughs> yeah, very well said, Steve. Else, Do we have any other questions? Make sure I'm not muted. I don't see any, but if uh, anyone out there in the, uh, any of our audience has any, feel free to, to throw them into the Q&A. And if we do not have time at the end, we'll make sure to send them out to uh, J Jeremy or Shu or, or both if, if applicable, so. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. So Thank next you. up we have Shu Schiller. Um, so she's going to be talking about storytelling it with data. Um, so taking a look at the components and the process to design good data stories um, in order to leverage those to drive better decision making um, processes. So with that, I will turn it over to Shu. All right. Erin, I'm just checking. Can you see my slides? We can. Okay, and I need to make sure that I can get access to the chat window. Am I able to do that? Um, I think, I think... So. Okay, I got it right here because I have some little bit, perhaps, participations for the, for the group. All right. Perfect. Good. So, yeah, stretch a little bit, all right, for the second hour of this wonderful group. So my name is Shu Schiller, and uh, I was uh, originally introduced to this uh, Columbus Tug group by Derek, of course, who I worked with about five years ago. I believe he just 
started at the time working with the Tableau. So in my uh, past few years, I have participated with uh, the Cincinnati group a few times, and uh, I had been a part of uh, the Columbus type group. And uh, last time I participated, it was the dashboard redesign of Chantilly. It was wonderful. It really blew me away. So I think the Columbus type group is really, really active. I'm very happy to be here today and talk with you from the education perspective, looking into storytelling with data. So I'm asking you to do a little bit exercise right now. All right, if, if you can see my screen, I hope you can. And cross your two hands, left hand, right hand, and just intertwine your fingers with each other. And then, yeah, Steve is doing it, I can see it. <laughs> and then look into your hand, which thumb is on the top? Do you have the left thumb on the top or do you have the right thumb on the top? And I want you to type into the chat so I can have a little bit of sense of the audience group. Do you have left on the top or do you have the right on the top? So I believe the answers that come in, left, right, right, left, right. All right, all right. My brain cannot process fast enough as a supercomputer, right? <laughs> okay, I see. Uh, I see a lot of left. Yes, I'm right. So why do we do this? This is a um, psychological experiment exercise. It's talking about the dominant brain, the left brain and the right brain. So here it goes. If you end up having your right thumb on the top, so that means your left brain is a dominant brain. So what's the part that's dominated more by our left brain? That's the quantitative side, right? That's the blood running in you, being an engineer, being a designer in terms of computer science, in terms of using numbers. So that's if you have the right thumb on top. If you have the left thumb on top, right? You are, of course, the dominant part of your brain is the right brain. And that's the part that creates the creative part, right? The creativity, the arts, the, the literature, and everything that you can say the opposite of the other. Now, the interesting thing is, if we do this little exercise, of course, without thinking about it, you can, you can use this as a way to tell, hey, by nature or by <laughs> the current status of my brain, am I more of an engineer and more of a artistic designer, right? Or just an artist, an artist. So it, it's interesting, this relates to my own journey. So by education, my background is information systems and, uh, and it was a, quite of a computer information system through the years of my training and I graduated from Temple University. For the past five years, I have been studying, doing research and also teaching in the area of business analytics and business data visualization, all this type of um, very exciting fields. And you know, I don't know about you, but I think five years ago, my kind of my right thumb is on the top, and now my left thumb is on the top. <laughs> anyway, take that as a joke, okay? So perhaps my work in the data visualization area has paid off. <laughs> All right, let's see. In the business world, Jeremy mentioned this, and this is so crucial for all of us to understand why, right? Why bother? Why having all this? big deal about data and storytelling. In the business world, we all need to communicate and it's so crucial and I cannot tell you enough whether you are the engineers or, you know, I tend to look at our majors. We have a management information systems majors and many students in that major study a concentration of business analytics. Guess what? Lots of us are introverts. We don't want to talk to people. We kind of hide behind the computer screens and we want to do great analyses. We want to create lots of um, visualization charts, but you know, don't let me talk to others. And that's okay for some of us, but I think more of us, we need to realize that communication is such a key thing today, right? In the business world, we have to communicate the insights we can bring to others. And it is so crucial today that we're talking about data communication. You use this all the time. You probably don't pay attention. So listen to the next elevator conversation. You probably would hear a conversation, a narrative, but in part of that, there may be a number jumping out. Hey, how are you guys doing in the marketing department? Oh, you know, sales are pretty up, I think. 
maybe in three states, right? So very, very literally in our daily conversations, we are having more and more of those data communication. What I, I really want to emphasize is really the part of the data communication. There are lots of different ways of doing data communication. When you publish your design, the dashboard, your visualization into Tableau Public, that is a great way of data communication. People come and interact with it and learn from it, right? And one type of data communication is telling the story. It's really involved some unique components in there that we will talk about today. Let's look at this question. I'm just very curious about the, uh, the group that are here with us today. Think about your most recent degree that you have received. Most recent, okay? How many years has it been? Can you type into your chat window? Let me see that. And if you're currently in the degree program, just say zero. So type in, oh my, some have been away from classroom for a while, right? <laughs> some of you are recently, perhaps have graduated from some program. Some of you, I see zeros, which means that you are currently studying in a program. Wonderful, very good, yeah. So I cannot calculate quick enough to have the average, the mean value, but I can, you cannot possibly be 99, right? EB, you gotta be joking. <laughs> <laughs> is that a no? <laughs> so the, the, what I want you to think about is this. What's the purpose of education, right? And you say, wow, that's a big question. People write hundreds of books, try to answer that question. Now to me, higher education is my practice field. That's where my passion is. That's my full-time job, that's my full faculty. I do research, I teach, I interact with my students. To me, it is so important because I think my job is to prepare my students. So when they are ready, they are ready to share their knowledge, their skills, and grow their abilities when they are working in the business field. So this experience that they are with me going through this higher education, going through an educational program, it's to get their minds prepared. Prepare for what? for the social good or the common good or the general population, all of us together, think about 10 years ago, what, are, what, what kind of the visualization tools we were using at that time compared to the collections of wonderful tools and knowledge and skill sets, or look into your own analytics team, right? Many of you are leading one. If you're looking at your talent group 10 or 15 years ago, Think about the dashboards that you created at that time compared to the Tableau dashboards you create today. Boy, that gotta be a big difference, right? So to me, it is really crucial to teach my students and prepare them for what the knowledge that is most needed in the business world today. And data analytics, data visualization, business data visualization, these are so crucial. As we speak today, I do believe I think there's absolutely a rising trend into the hiring field in the future that is highly interdisciplinary, which means great, you're a marketing, right? Marketing major, marketing internship, marketing position. What kinds of analytics can you do? Wonderful, you are accounting, you have been studying audit. How about analytics in the auditing field, right? How about text analytics in the auditing field? So there are lots of skill sets today are really, really interdisciplinary. So if you are current, for those who answer zeros, right, in your chat, if you are current in an educational program, think about how you can possibly expand the domains of your knowledge. So think about big chunks of domain. And then let me ask you this question. There gotta be room. How do you plug in telling stories, telling data stories? among all the knowledge domains that you have and practice that when you can. Now I'm gonna ask my audience again, come to my rescue. Can you recognize this chart? If you know the author or if you know what it was, anything about this chart, I know I don't have a high res. This is a low res that I was able to find. Anybody? Yes! Justin, great, 
Yes, wonderful, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Great, wonderful. So this beautiful chart, some of you probably have studied it, right? Perhaps in Jeremy's class. <laughs> and it's, it was created, it was a long time ago, right? It was a Florence Nightingale. Now Florence Nightingale, now Jeremy, when you mentioned that community, there's a Nightingale community, I was not aware of that, but now I'm thinking, is there any connection between those two? So let me tell you about Florence Nightingale. Now she was, of course, she lived her life about 160 years uh, ahead of us. And at that time, not many women had the choice to pursue their dreams. She really defied her family at the time by not marrying <laughs> in the typical way that she would have. And instead she went to Germany and obtained her professional training in nursing. And what really made her famous was the Crimean War. The Crimean War was a really large war by the scope and of course mortality of that before the, uh, the big ones that we know of today as the World War I and II. What happened at that time is the Crimean was a little area, the Cr Crimea is uh, the island, I hope you can see the circle on my map, mapped into the modern day Google map, okay? to the north of the Black Sea. So there was at the time a great war between Russia, primarily from the Russian Empire, and a few countries in Europe. And the war had triggered lots of, of course, uh, mortality and wounds and soldiers, and there are a great number of wounded soldiers. So Nightingale at that time was so courageous. She led a group of women, courageous women, and some of them were nurses by training, some of them were nuns. And she led this group of women to the southwest part of the Black Sea. And here on the map, the arrow is pointing to, which would be modern day Turkey at that time is Ottoman Empire. And since 1923, we all know this country region as Turkey. So that would be modern day Istanbul. So she worked there and in hospitals. The one fantastic thing she did was that she started to take data and writing her data journals and eventually created this beautiful chart. You can call this, you know, some people refer to this as tiered pie chart or the coxcomb chart, or it could be a, um, a rose chart. I have seen the word describing that. And you may notice three different colors in this chart, right? It's all faded. Again, it's not a high res. But what this story unfolds, right? How it unfolds is that it's astonishing to all of them who are involved in the war and trying to save the lives of the soldiers. The blue area, very light blue, look at the area. That indicates the count or the, by number, the quantity, the mortality caused by poor sanitary. So those zymotic causes, right? These were the reasons or infectious disease, they are contagious, and for wounded soldiers and took their lives eventually. Compared to the red ones, if you can see in the chart in the middle, those were the real mortality, the rates created by gun wounds, right? The direct wounds that soldiers received from the war. So the astonishing finding of her data story is that, hey, the poor sanitary is the reason we're losing lives here at the war hospital. And guess what? The most amazing thing is call for action, right? Jeremy said that 20 times in his presentation. What actions can we take? Well, you bet. They were changing sheets very often. They open the windows to have fresh air. They make sure that water uh, was clean. They made sure that the bandages were changed every day. And the end result of this was that many more lives were saved because of Nightingale's data story and actions they took. So then, of course, there's a lot of more, more story about Nightingale and how she really established the modern nursing as a medical field. Absolutely beautiful story. I want to tell you that why this is important because not just that we understand the data and the visualization in here. This was 160 years ago as a part of a war, but people 
were taking actions based on the data insights they discovered, right? So to me, I think that is the most significant part of this data story. Well, fast forward to modern day. I will let you read the line on the bus. <laughs> of course, this was a few years ago, and if you were even watching or following the Britain, the Great Britain, or the uh, United Kingdom, right, exiting the EU, the European Union, I love this, this is, of course, from a book that you can see the citation on the side. It's a short sentence, yet it is a powerful story, right? It has data in there, does it? Not only it mentions the 350 million, but it's a week. So there's a frequency included in the data set as well. And there is a narrative. It's talking about, hey, this much money. By the way, don't waste it. How about we take the money and build our own national health service? And that's the national health platform in the UK. So the, my favorite part, of course, you know what? you agree with it that that's another story but I think it's a brilliant example showing a data story that involved the data the narrative and call for action right beautiful so now how many of you I, I bet probably everybody if you have can you type into the chat window let me see so Hans and Rosling oh my goodness have you watched his videos talking about his data stories, how many you have? Yes, yes, yeah, I see a few yeses here. Very good, so our group probably contributed half of the YouTube views, right? <laughs> Millions. So if you have not, beautiful way to tell a data story. So I had a two here, you go, go ahead, you search yourself, it's so easy that you can find Heinz Rosslings. And two versions, two stories right here I provide one was a TED talk that he gave and talking about a moving emotion bubble chart. So, you know, Tableau, you can build those bubble chart and have this motion and moving. My students absolutely loved it. It's a lot of fun and it's really, really dramatic when you see the motion, right? So then the other story is he's talking about 200 countries in 200 years in a very short video produced using a crew. They can see that's not a real a window in front of him. It's actually a digital projection. So when he did the video, he had to look into empty room and just try to do all these motions. So it's pretty dramatic, very, very interesting. So the point is that, yeah, I see that. Steve, you're a big fan of Hans Rosling, right? That's wonderful. And he was one of, I believe, the best narrators of telling data stories. You know, I don't have to preach to the choir. We all love data, there's no doubt. However, that's not the case for all the people out there, right? <laughs> Lots of times we have to really make it engaging. And, and I think Hans absolutely is one of the best data storytellers out there. So I want you to share this with you. If you have not, go ahead and watch them. They're brilliant. So why bother telling data stories? As humans, we're just naturally drawn into narratives and stories. Think about when we were kids, right? Bring a picture book and your parents are telling you the stories and that's human nature. And because that really, I think it invigorates imagination, our thinking, our reasoning with each other. So it's just by nature, the best way to communicate with each other and a community, by the way. And what is relevant to you and me in this case is that why data story, right? So we all know how and the means and the tools to find the data insights. So my recommendation is think about in the past year or so, when you have created data insights, it could be a beautiful chart, Tableau dashboard, some visuals, something, and how exactly you have communicated that insights. Who did you talk to? How did you share it? How many people have viewed it? What kind of uh, new knowledge that you have shared with others? And when people see that and say, wow, you know, oh, oh, I haven't thought about this before. Oh, that's new information. 
So that's what makes a difference in the business world. We need to really promote the sharing of the data insights. Now, you know, Steve and Jeremy from a higher education background, we all know that one part of what we do as, as faculty members to produce research, the same thing, when we generate a new knowledge and you do that all the time, you gotta take that new knowledge and take it and share that with all people that you can. And so, of course, in the business domain, it is so crucial for us to do what? Call for the actions and drive changes. So I think I once heard somebody say, if, if you uh, learn something yet take no actions, there is no value in that information you have learned. So I, I do think that's very true. And so when people read your dashboards, interact with your visualizations, what actions have they taken? Or what actions have we taken to try to change some business decisions or make things better, right? So that is a very crucial part. I also want to add, because I'm a faculty member, so get my students the best employment opportunities is also my responsibility. In the business world today, let's say I mentioned that some information system students tend to be introverts, don't want to talk to anybody, just let me do my thing. So we talk about soft skills today are becoming more and more crucial. Soft skills, how to communicate, how to talk to people, how to work with, with others. Now, if you even have this data storytelling capability or some achievements or some accomplishments under this umbrella, it's going to significantly increase your employment opportunities or perhaps, you know, the opportunities that I can seek within your organization. So I do think that's a great competence for you to keep building up along the way. Right. So for my class, classes, I taught a few, and when I had storytelling with the data in my class, my students were allowed to use their own data, and they create their data story using Tableau, and Tableau is the tool that I use in my class, and after they build the data story, they are also required to make a video to tell their story. So now you can see that this is a really put them in front of the camera, and they have to record everything themselves either in front of their desktop camera, some of them go to the library and use their green room to create this um, video in 10 minutes. They start from the beginning of their story and then move along and tell all the details of their data story into the end of the story. And then I have a collection of all these data stories and, and I, I keep learning and, and sharing them with my students. So these are some of the very small uh, pictures that I, of course, in my collection. It has been going very well, by the way. I want to tell you, it's really uncomfortable for lots of students to do this. Many students have not had the opportunity to be asked as a requirement in the class to record a video to tell their story. <laughs> so many, many of them do presentations all the time, of course, but this is new. So I think I was, I am still stretching their muscles and kind of push them to, uh, to practice telling the stories and making the effective communication in front of their people, in front of the audience. Right, that's great. How do we build a data story? Huh, there's gotta be some guidelines we can follow through, right? Let's take a look at that. So a data story, or maybe like all story, has some unique components. And so first it has the context. And I will talk more about that. And then a will have to involve all the visuals. So you guys are, are the experts creating all these um, Tableau visuals and all the dashboards, interactivity and all that in there. So those are the visuals. And then what we don't think much about, which I really want to talk about here today, is the narrative. How do we build the narrative together? So let's take a look. Context is very important. I believe Jeremy mentioned this in his talk as well. It's the people that you talk to. Now, when you design a dashboard, you probably have a good idea who will be interacting with this dashboard, right? And when you design a data story, you probably would have some idea who will be the likely audience interacting with your data story. Now, it could be the general public, that's fine, right? Or it could be a specific group of people, especially when you create something that 
is going to be shared internally, you could probably have a better idea who are likely to be using it. Understanding your people is really, really important. This applies to all kinds of communication, face-to-face -face communication, virtual communication, and data communication. So do you know your audience well? What are the areas they are working on? What's the, what's the data they understand now they have and what do they want to know in addition to what they've already known? How can your data story be relevant to them? Is that sales data to the sales group? Is that marketing predictive, predictive model to the marketing and salesperson? Or is something completely different? How can people relate to your story and so therefore they can make implications relevant, right? And they take the actions that are most effective. So spend, spend some time and understand your audience. That's very, very crucial. And of course, lots of times our data stories, our dashboards, they are published to the public domain and many people interact with it. So you can also bear in your mind, there is a wide spectrum of knowledge about data. Again, I'm not talking to our group right here. I'm talking about Remember the left of thumb on top thing and lots of, lots of people perhaps have not been interacting that much in a quantitative domain. And how can our data story be even effective with them? Right, so that's important. And then the visuals, that's not the focus of my talk today. And all these talk meetings, you have many hundreds, perhaps hours of recordings on how to build certain types of visualizations and Tableau and so forth. So that is crucial. That perhaps is the most time consuming in, throughout this entire process of data storytelling. I really want to talk to you about narrative. Narrative, think about as a theme that you would go through and thread through its entire story. Make them seamless, seamless and meaningful from the beginning to the end. And what are in the middle that you're threading through? Those are the visuals that we create, right? From one thing to the next, to the next, and to the end. But narrative is so important. Just like when you open a children's picture book, there's the picture, visual. And usually there's perhaps a few sentences under the picture. That's the narrative. So our job, part of that is really to build a narrative according to a certain structure. So let's take a look. I'm going to introduce to you a few models for building your own narratives. And I'd be very happy to share my slides later. So the narrative models, there are many of them. If you study journalism, for example, or even movie making, there are, there are many, many different types of models for building a story. What I have picked here, I think are making sense to me and my teaching and receptive and really, uh, seemed very helpful to my students in the past, so I share those with you. Now, some of these are from the book, which I will talk more about, from uh, Brent Dykes, and he published the book very recently. It's called Effective Data Storytelling. And in this first model, you probably all know Aristotle, right? More than 2,000 years ago, he has constructed this story model, drama, tragedy structure and we have all seen this from the beginning there there are three components the beginning beginning of the story the middle of the story and the end of the story so everybody's good with that right so then we have gustav freitag who was a german uh, novelist and he built upon his model on top of aristotle's model what he introduced the more into this model and he argued about there has to be a beginning as expositions in the beginning. It's a kind of a, some exciting moment to get people's attention, right? Something to hook them. Hey, they want to stay and listen to the rest of your story. And then he said that there has to be a way of this rising action, the rising tension, which leads to the climax of the story. And of course, after that, usually there is a not essentially downturn, but it's more of a resolution and lead to the end of the story. Now, when I look at this model, I often think about Romeo and Juliet, right? How many of you have watched that? The play or the movie, there are so many versions of them. But anyhow, you can think of the beginning, the middle, right? The climax of that story, 
and the end of the story and the resolution of the conflicts and all the pieces all put together. So free tag has created this pyramid model that has become really, really fundamental to lots of even Hollywood movies to build upon their story on top of this model. What else do we have? So Dr. Joseph Kimbell, he was a very famous American a professor and his background was he was doing research and teaching literature. And he had so many very good quotes. Some of you probably have heard about them before. For example, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Wow. So that's from Dr. Campbell. Dr. Campbell also created a story model. And he's a narrative model in this case called Hero's Journey. What this talks about is that, hey, think about a hero, some heroic figure that you can name, right? There's a departure of this hero's journey. Where did it go? And, the, the, and then there's initiation, and normally there's a tension built upon, there's self-struggle, but there's a moment, tri trials and tribulations to the hero, and there's a moment of really taking lots of actions, for example, riding the white horse and rescuing a princess, you know, all kinds of action like that, right? And then there's a return journey of this hero comes to a, perhaps a resolution of some sort. There's got some more struggles and some more conflicts built into that. And come to the beginning. Now, this is not the original beginning. It comes back to a new level of a beginning. So we can all relate to this, right? And some people even did a very thorough analysis using the hero's journey and said that that is fit perfectly, fits perfectly to Luke Skywalker and his journey in one of the Star Wars movies. Some of you probably are fans of Star Wars journey, the Star Wars movies. So this model was literally can fit perfectly into Luke Skywalker's journey. So how can this be relevant to you and me? I, you know, I was really, I was, I fell in love with this model because guess where it can work the best is if you have a type of persona in your data and, you know, we work with uh, lots of companies in the Dayton area and one of the company is a care source who, which provides healthcare benefits to lots of multiple states. So care source has a very active analytics team. And one of the things they created was a persona and Many of you probably know how to, you know, all the details getting into the statistics and analytics to do the persona. But once you structure a persona, this type of hero's journey can really apply to that persona or segment of your customers or some kind of type of human figure or their experiences. It could be a unit. It could be a segment. It could be a persona. How could their data journey go, right? Oh my gosh, that unit, their sales had decrease the 50% in the beginning of this year, you know, and then they did this and then they did that and then they did this and then come back, had more challenges. So the data can really be mapped into this journey to tell a full story. So I think that'd be a beautiful application for this hero's journey. What I want to share with you that worked very well for, for myself and my classes is this, this model created by Brent Dykes. And I love his book. I think it's very, very comprehensive. It has enough theory, background, and applications. So the way we do this is that for our data story, think about there has to be a setting. Introduce who's in the story. The main characters is your customer or is maybe a thing, an entity of some sort, right? And then there are some data insights that we're going to unfold one story page after next story page one, two, three, four, up to the point that Brent caught this, caused this aha moment, the biggest discovery. Oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, that's a great point. Wow, that's a great discovery. So the aha moment kind of serves as the climax of our story. And then here's the very important thing, is that to the end of the story, it really calls for action in the way that it tells people, this is not the end. This is the end of the story, but not the end of what we do. We can have options, we can have recommendations, we can ask meaningful questions. All of this at the end of the data story is to promote people to do more, to discover more, 
to drive more, right? To have more insights. So that's very, very important at the end of the story. How does this all work, right? So let's take a look. Assuming, and I know you have your Tableau dashboards, everything in your Tableau. Think about, you have many, many building blocks you have created. They could be sheets, they could be dashboards. You probably have 20 of them, 50 of them outside this data set that you've been working on. Our job is to fit all of our insights to this story model. I will call this the ARC model. The ARC model has a few very significant points that we need to identify. They serve as the backbone. Once we have the backbone, we can put the flesh in there, right? The flesh comes after the bone. So we have this setting that we need to figure out in the beginning as introduction. We have this big aha moment, the climax of the story, and then we have the ending. We want to drive actions. So I labeled here as A, B, and C. Now I'm gonna ask you, ask you to type in the chat. There's no wrong answer, by the way, all answers are correct. So what would you prefer to do if you're building a data story, have lots of data insights, would you start with the setting first? Would you start with your aha moment first? Would you start with your driving actions moment? Where would you pinpoint first in your backbone with A or B or C? Yeah, uh-huh, A, uh-huh, yeah, A, A, B, yeah. Yeah, start with the actions. Let's me know what data to pull. That's great insight, A or B, C, yeah. Great, aha uh -huh moment, wonderful, yeah. So, like I said, there's no wrong answer. Every answer is correct. It's personal preference, but there is perhaps a one point I want to make, and I do agree with Brent on this. So when Brent was talking about his model, his recommendation is that build your aha moment first. Well, why, why this? It's not that it's the best thing for all the data stories, it's just a one simple recommendation. It may work well for some situations, may not for others, because every data story is very different. The aha moment is a climax. You kind of, it's kind of like creative writing. You sort of know the most epic point of your story. The uh, most surprising finding, right? Your main characters got in trouble and something happened. Ooh, that changed everything afterwards. So that's the epic moment of the aha moment. So according to Brent, his recommendation is define your aha moment first. Let that guide the rest of the bone structure and the flesh that we will fill in. And then the next thing we can do is we start to set our settings. Think about the characters that we have involved in there. When I say characters, I don't really mean a person. I mean, it can really be a unit such as the, uh, the shipping department, right? Or it could be some entity of some sort. And then there's a little thing there. There's a hook in the beginning. So I, wanna, I want to tell you why this makes sense. Well, you know, people are busy, right? And lots of times they, don't, they would say, I don't have time for your 10 minutes of story, <laughs> right? Fine. What can we do to get them interested in listening to us? All right, you don't have 10 minutes. Maybe I can tell a five second data story. <laughs> I'm making this up, of course. So let's say you bumped into your colleague on, in the hallway and you say, you say, hey, um, Dave, guess what? Hey, I was looking at the sales, sales data, the chart. You know, all of the units had a, a decrease in sales except one, one department. And then you walk away. <laughs> What's going to happen? I think your friend, David, if he was really listening, right? He probably would come and find you and say, hey, can you tell me what unit, <laughs> right? When all other departments had decreased the sales, you said one, who, who was that? And now you have the perfect moment to unfold your data story. <laughs> so anyhow, you know, this really may work well. Think about very busy executives. You need to get their attention. Get a little hook, but make sure there's data related into that. Once you have the perfect moment, have that data story unfold in front of your audience. The next step is to have your building blocks. So this rising insights, right? All of the things that rise from the setting and all will lead to the final aha moment. How do you put it together? Whoa, you guys are the experts of those. 
because all of the insightful visuals that you create, you have to organize them in a certain way that they will make sense. So typically, you show relationships, right? You show trends, you demonstrate, you can call out the outliers, you can compare, you can drill down, you can have lots of different techniques used. And by the way, how long is this rising insights? It really depends. It can be two visuals. It can be 10 or 20, it depends on the story, right? But the idea is that what can you put in layers of unfolding? And my recommendation is this. Typically what we do this is that by introducing some new elements step by step. So for example, in your setting of the story, you may mention about this one unit and you may involve two variables. I say variables or data fields, right? And then now you can perhaps building the rising insights by introducing new variable or new data, by introducing new records or appending, by introducing new types of visualizations, right? These things can help you to build up these rising insights. Now remember, our job is really to share the insights. So there got to be some deeper discovery along the way until you reach the aha moment, right? I hope that makes sense. So then in the end, again, like I mentioned, this is very important. We have to do what? Call for action, drive changes, actions and changes. Make those your kind of expected outcomes of your next data story, okay? Challenge yourself. What actions are you calling for? What changes are you intending to drive? If you are short of words to play with your narrative, and here, uh, here are a list of all the verbs, wonderful verbs that you can probably consider for some of your narratives. But the main point is, yeah, we got to change something, take some actions. Your audience, by the time they hear the end of your story, they will have this feeling, ooh, I got to go back and check this, this, this. Ooh, I got to go. And, you know, I wonder if I can have data from this, this, or that. So it really triggers more conversation down the road. Let me show you, hopefully I have time for two stories in here, but I'm show you briefly the first one. And if you are, of course, at your computer, some of you know this example so well, I'm gonna type in this into the chat window. So this is a famous earthquake story and tableau story. If you have the link, you can go explore and do step-by-step -step storytelling. So it has a very clear beginning, the setting of these earthquakes right, on earth, what happens to them, to the very end of the story that telling about the trend, or is there a trend, right, so that's a very famous data story and built in Tableau, and let's see if this model works, the arc model, in the beginning, introduces, it seems like a lot of earthquakes these days, right, so the hook there is that, ooh, is there a trend, is there a trend, if you look to the very top of the state of story, it's asking that question. Are big earthquakes on the rise? And that is a very good hook. Immediately get people's attention, right? And they are interested. Oh, I want to know. I want to know. So let's look at the story. By building the insights the author used, right? Introducing the variables, including magnitude, times, locations. And you can see all these geographic locations around the world beautiful geographic visualizations, and also uses different types of visualizations. The maps are beautiful. And in the end, it's a trend chart, it's a line chart showing the trends. And it's highly interactive, has lots of rich information if someone wants to interact with the chart. And also in the very end, it reviews this finding, guess what? Um, aha moment, right? And it's, it's not a very clear trend. Oh, great. <laughs> now what? So the aha moment is not a very clear trend for the next big earthquakes or if the big earthquakes are on the rise. But the interesting part to call for action, you bet, is that we need to do more observations. So scientists understand this. There's never enough data the way that you want to analyze, right? There's always more for you to observe. So what else do I prepare? Oh, so here's my another question for you to participate in the chat. If you are a parent, your kids, you and your kids or children are probably thinking about this one big thing. 
are the schools going to open <laughs> in the fall? So can you type in the chat if your kids school or just pick one, right? If it's going to be most in person or most online or most hybrid, type in the chat. Most online, okay, hybrid, 50-50, hybrid, okay, online. Unfortunately, online, I feel your pain. <laughs> My daughter is in eighth grade. She can't wait to go back to school. It's not often hearing things like, mom, I want to go back to school. Anyway, hybrid, hybrid online in person. Thank you for sharing. So this data story I want to share with you. Let me also type it in the chat. So if you want to, you can always interact with it. And this is published in the Chronicle of Higher Education, I believe yesterday, yes. And so the data story is in the beginning. Hey, everybody, we're talking about college's fall opening, which is in two and a half weeks. And what is everybody doing? And here's this big pie chart in the beginning. By the way, Jeremy, I completely agree with you. My students know my attitude toward pie charts. By the way. I avoid pie charts at all costs possible. Those, anyway, the story starts with a pie chart. Look how the colleges, and some of them are going to be open. Most of them are, if you look at these slices, TBD is one. Primary online is a big chunk right here. Primarily in person is this another big chunk. And there's a hybrid, another big chunk, right? And then some small pieces. So that really got my attention because our campus, right, State University, our thinking right now, as the plan goes, is hybrid model, or we call that flexible. So flex model. We tend not to use hybrid. So we use a flex model. And then what else does the story say? The rising insights, right? Hey, you, now you have kind of got the idea of national level, the, the slices of the distribution of these plans. Guess what? I'm gonna share with you introducing another new variable and that is the college type, all right? So the building of the insights in this case uses a new variable. If we drag into the college type, and I show you only the two images here with the two, but if you do the interactive on the website, you can interact, interact with this and see all the four types. So there is a difference between the public four-year college and the, pub, the private four-year college. And then there's also difference about two-year colleges. Now you notice this scale, right? The scale is not the same numeric value. So don't get that um, to deceive you, deceive you. But the idea is that the distribution of these different types are different for public four year versus private four year, right? And that is a very interesting insight to look into. For public schools by count, right? I think not as many as private schools by count to open primarily in person. Hmm, is that interesting? Yeah, I think so. So then what's the aha moment? Well, the aha moment is being pre presented by introducing this beautiful geographic visualization. And it's also searchable. So I have this image here. If you do that online, type in the college that you want to see. I did my state university right here. Jeremy is probably checking his right now. <laughs> so with Rice State introduced here in this aha moment is, guess what? Such decision may be depending upon the cases, right? The new cases were in the past seven days. I believe that's what they used before. And now the number and the changes of those cases in that particular region. So for Wright State University, we're in the Green County and we had a 70.7 .7 new cases per 100,000. So that's normalized. I love that, normalized by the population since last week. Now, I bet if Jeremy searches his, I think about when it's probably in the county, Cuyahoga, I, I believe, may have a higher number of cases per the 1,100 residents in that area. So that's the aha moment. Wow, it's depending upon those cases and the new rises of cases. So then the, in the end, right, the, drives of the, the drive of the actions is look into more of the details of the data because we need to keep monitoring those cases. Those seven day new week, new cases per week has always been changing. Look at the trends of that and compare the trends and against the college's decisions. 
Now this can this data story model can be used for you know your kids elementary schools, uh, middle schools, and high schools as well, right? That would be a really interesting data story to tell. So again, in this model, the ARC model, it introduces the setting. It also presents us the rising insight, insights by introducing new variables, leading to the aha moment, and then call for the actions in the end for more observations and keep monitoring the data. What else do I have? Oh, so a quick review of what we learned today in this session, we talked about data stories and we reviewed a Nightingale story, the uh, Brexit story, right? Very interesting sh uh, short story. And we talked about why bother, why do data stories? And the key thing is about communicating data insights and to drive actions, drive changes, very crucial. And then we talked about how to build data stories. We looked at four different models and I chose to focus on the ARC model, which can be designed by thinking about the context, organizing the visuals, and using particular narrative. And that can lead into telling the story from the setting to the aha moment and to calling the actions in the end. And then we look at the two stories very quickly, the earthquake story and also the college fall opening story. I also have a reading list for you if you are interested. I love, so this is Brent, Brent Dyke's storytelling book. It's effective storytelling. I think it's very comprehensive with theory and implications. In the past, I also used the visual data storytelling and written by Lindy Ryan. She was a professor, I believe, at Rogers University, and now she's probably doing her consulting firm herself. And there's also a good book about the, uh, the workbook. So there are many, many uh, visualization story, uh, the uh, books, right, available. So I picked some that are specifically focusing on the storytelling. So there are many others. You know, Jeremy had some really good books that he mentioned as well. So if you are very techy, and I also recommend you look into some academic journals. Not everybody falls in love with academic journals. Okay, I get it. <laughs> but if you are having that in your blood, you want to do more academic research, human computer interaction, the Inter International Journal of Human Computer Studies and IEEE Transactions has a really good journal that's on visualization and computer graphics that goes way beyond business domain, by the way, medical, engineering, you name it. But these can give you some really good content for you to read. So then you can go out there, right? I only have one request for those who are still listening. When you go out there after today, think about your data story, build your data story and tell your data story. All right. Oh, I have a few minutes left. Um, maybe not because we have announcement, right? I'm sorry, Steve. Shoe, Jeremy, or any of us leaders. Now it's up. There we go. Always do that. All right. So, do we have any questions for Shu, Jeremy, or the leadership team? Shu, I have a quick one. Um, just, I just wondered. You know, you were talking about getting folks, your students, to focus on that driving change. Is that the area where where the people you teach tend to struggle the most or is there another area that through your experiences you've come to expect the biggest challenge in terms of this whole process there are two biggest challenges in my own experience one is because uh, here's also almost like a, a blessing and a curse at the same time because we're pushing data visualization and storytelling to all business students. And many business students don't have that um, information system or database background, right? So you're looking at a very general population of students, college students. Some of them are not comfortable or have not taken advanced database classes. Mm -hmm. So handling R or just having a very good understanding, some of the classes is Python and it's really not easy for all students to grasp that very quickly. Therefore, they can start building these insights. So that's challenge number one. We're doing better though, I think, because the more, more classes are integrating business analytics throughout the different domains. Mm -hmm. So business students are having more exposure 
to this concept and more practice. So that is getting better. Mm -hmm. The second challenge, you're absolutely right. Lots of business students today, right? Um, I tend to think that if they already got some work experience, this makes perfect sense to them. Mm -hmm. For those who have not, usually we need to channel their concept model of how to drive changes. That's another struggle. So we, we try to do that. For example, students having all experiential learning, all uh, internships and all that, or just working on projects with a company, right? Real life learning. These are absolutely helpful. You can tell the difference, Steve. I'm, you probably have the experience as well. You probably have tons, tons of interns yourself. I think there is a drastic change for them who's got some um, practical experiences right? And then understand driving change, what that means. So it's a journey, definitely not a destination. Yeah. Thank you. Erin, anything else or? Nothing that I can think of in terms of questions wise. Um, so for the 64 individuals that are still on the phone, we have an exciting announcement. Um, so you guys are getting the preview of what is to come in August, um, but we are going to be doing a Columbus Viz competition. Um, so this is something that if you are interested in joining the Iron Viz, or maybe you have a hackathon or a Viz, Vizathon within your organization, you can submit that to our Viz competition. Um, and then the three individuals that get selected as like the top presenters or the top visualizations will actually be able to come to our user group in September and speak about their content. So we will be launching this next month officially, but for the 64 of you on the phone, um, start getting your data ready. Um, it can be any kind of data that you want. It could be health data, it could be looking at COVID, it could be looking at the Olympics, um, anything and everything goes, whatever you're interested in. The biggest thing is we want you guys to be able to tell that story. Um, there is potential to have something for those who are more advanced versus those who are just getting started. Um, and then along with this, when you are submitting your presentation and your visualization to um, the platform that we will have set up next month, basically what we're going to ask you for is your inspiration, um, what led you to build the dashboard that you had built, as long as well as contact information. Um, and then what that's going to do is that platform is going to be open up to anyone and everyone within the Columbus as well as virtual community to go in and upvote or like favorite their favorite dashboards. Um, and those with the three most likes will get to present at the following um, session. And then we, there is prizes that Tableau is going to be handing out. So Derek is in charge of that, um, but yeah. Get excited. Should be fun competition. So is there any questions on that um, or over the content today? And the recording is going to be stored. We are going to start posting those onto our splash, pa splash page. Um, so on our Columbus Hub website will be the link to the recording as well as the content. Very exciting. Thanks, Aaron. And thanks to our wonderful presenters. Excellent job. Great stuff. And, and like to uh, the folks that are still hanging out, if you have any questions, reach out to us directly. Hit us up on the LinkedIn page. I know Aaron's still active on MySpace. You pick the channel. We'll be sure to, to get back to you within uh, in a reasonable amount of time. So again, thank you very much. Is that good, Aaron? We're ready to I think we're ready to close it out. We haven't paid the big money for any 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 music, so maybe Aaron will join us in a song or just hit the stop recording I'm button. I'm going to hit the leave button before you all listen right, to me right. sing. Right. <laughs> Have a great week, everyone, thank and thank thanks you. for tuning in. And, and thanks Shu. to our presenters. Yep. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.